I think I'm going. Yeah, I'm going. All right, John. Hello, John McWhorter. Hello, Glenn Lowry. How are you Hello. doing? I'm doing well. Welcome to the Glenn Show. I'm uh, Glenn Lowry of Brown University and of BloggingHeads.tv. And I'm John McWhorter of Columbia University and occasional guest on BloggingHeads.tv. A regular guest on the Glenn Show, John. Indeed. Uh, that is true. And it's a good thing, too. And uh, here we are today. It's uh, the dog days of August. Uh, presidential campaign is in full swing. Uh, we, both being academics, have been whiling away our summers with various activities more or less legitimate and more or less co uh, productive and constructive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we just thought we'd get together for a chat. Um, uh, insofar as we have an agenda for the conversation, I guess we're going to talk a bit about affirmative action. I think I have an interesting take on the affirmative action conversation, and this is an issue that's going to be important going forward because the Supreme Court will be hearing a big case uh, in uh, the fall term. And you've developed some new perspectives on it from being overseas, right? I have. One of my summer travels took me to Nepal. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the South Asian country in the uh, foothills of the Himalayas, nestled between India mm -hmm. and the autonomous region of Tibet, mm -hmm. of China. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're having a big debate about affirmative action over there, and uh, my uh, uh, angle of uh, sort of vision on the arguments about affirmative action is somewhat different in uh, view of having been present at a, a big conference on that subject in Nepal, so we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I thought we might talk about here, uh, this uh, uh, dog day of August, uh, heat of the election campaign day, is... Um, Mitt Romney's uh, new angle of attack on President Obama in the campaign, which is to sort of refight the welfare reform mm -hmm. debates of the 1990s. And I think if we uh, cover those, we'll have spent our time well. Indeed. So, so you're basically uh, saying that um, Nepal has decided, as we did here in America, and I think it was a good thing that we did, that it's not fair to expect a historically oppressed group to simply climb up from the bottom, even if conditions have been approved somewhat, without some sort of deliberate mechanisms put in place in society to give them a boost upward. So, yes, um, one of the things that's happening in Nepal, and I'll explain a little bit more about the backdrop, is that they see affirmative action as a critical element of a dialogue about national reconciliation and, you know, new directions and their uh, uh, nascent democracy. And they see the toolkit of various kinds of quota, set-aside, reservation, uh, policies of protection of language minorities, uh, political representation based on some kind of quota-like or group recognition-like basis. Affirmative action would encompass the word affirmative action would encompass all of that kind of policy. Mm -hmm. It's not just an education. Mm -hmm. um, they see that as, if not a panacea, well, as a as a really important element of what they're trying to do going forward. Mm -hmm. And what interested me in the contrast with the debate in the United States is that, whereas um, here, um, after uh, 40 years of uh, one or another kind of uh, affirmative action initiative and effort and the big debate that's going on around it and the back and forth and all these Supreme Court cases and all of this uh, emotional energy that's gone into it, the affirmative action issue as a, one of the fronts on which the culture wars of the 1980s uh, were fought and all of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, and, and so it's very controversial and it's becoming passe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just going to state my position up front here. I think affirmative action is yesterday's question, and it's almost an afterthought now how the Supreme Court will resolve the debate. I, I'm not saying it won't impact people's lives if the court were to strike down uh, affirmative action in a definitive way. It would, but it's playing around the margins of our historical dynamic. There, it's absolutely central uh, to what they're doing. So uh, it's, it's a very different feel uh, about it. And it's like any general law or statement about affirmative action. I remember Thomas Sowell, uh, the conservative African-American economist, used to write these books uh, 
about affirmative action. He has one, uh, Racial Preferences, a Worldwide Disaster, was one of the articles, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you go around to 18 different countries and you try to count. And I just think that we should mention his book, which was called Affirmative Action Around the World, which I think came out just about nine years ago, so it would still be. Okay, I didn't remember the I didn't remember the title of the book. And it encapsulated that work of his. Yeah, and here I'm not picking a a kind of left-right argument with Tom Sowell about uh, whether affirmative action is a good or a bad thing. He was against it. I've been for it throughout uh, much of the last uh, sort of 20 years of the debate. Mm But um, what I'm saying is, there, you know, the project of trying to view this policy in some kind of global, integrated perspective, and to think that there's a truth about it which is somehow universally applicable, uh, seems to me to be uh, uh, not uh, defensible. I mean, because the uh, meaning of these debates is very historically specific and very kind of sensitive to the historical context, the political cultural context uh, in which it's being carried out. So for example, what I mean is uh, uh, in Nepal they've had this Hindu uh, caste system with untouchability uh, being practiced and the kind of Dalit, the the lower caste people being really um, you know marginalized and subordinated within the population and it's been going on for many generations and an elite, uh, which is an upper caste Hindu elite, uh, have been running the country, dominant in all of the institutions, in the government, in the educational sector, in the military, um, in the business sector, um, uh, linguistically dominant. Uh, And so now, uh, after um, years of a near civil war, uh, a Maoist-inspired insurgency, out in the uh, countryside, which had captured the hearts and minds of a non-trivial part of the lower class and caste elements of the Nepal population. Uh, That insurgency has basically succeeded in gaining legitimacy in the political arena and becoming a kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of catalyst for a uh, left of center um, uh, political uh, initiative that is uh, involved now in shaping the future of the country. They're drafting a constitution. Uh, the old uh, Hindu monarch was basically deposed and abdicated uh, in, I think, 2005 or so. Um, and um, the uh, uh, Maoist communist uh, uh, political elements are the largest single block of votes in the Constituent Assembly, which is drafting this Constitution. And so uh, that's a long-winded way of me simply saying the context there within which they talk about, quote, affirmative action, close quote, because all these quota-like group recognition policies is so very, very different. The legitimacy of using these group designations as a template for the framing of social policy is beyond question. Nobody is even questioning it. There is no uh, sort of ideology of individualism and, you know, uh, people's rights to be uh, judged independently of the group that they belong to. It's just taken for granted that they're going to be talking in uh, these group-oriented terms. And um, the the range of uh, areas of uh, public life where they're prepared to entertain uh, the use of policies like this is much, much broader. You know, seats in the legislature reserved for particular groups uh, to elect the representatives of their choosing, something that wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be countenanced here. So, and that's that's my observation about the international, um, you know, um, uh, about having viewed the affirmative action debate from two different national perspectives. Uh, just how uh, much I realize the debate is sensitive to the context in which it's taking place. It seems to me that um, what you're saying taps into the fact that affirmative action, really, you're talking about it being a somewhat obsolete debate now, and I would agree with you on that. I see the affirmative action debate in this country as a leftover, and yeah, I do mean that, a leftover policy and way of thinking from a time 40 years ago now when I think it made much more concrete sense. And the main problem with affirmative action today is an overhanging question, which I don't think anybody has an answer to that could create consensus, which is when do you end it? And or 
is it permanent? So a lot of what you described in terms of what's recently happened in Nepal, certainly nothing as extreme as a communist insurgency or the deposing of a monarch, but in terms of a leftist insurgence and a new societal awareness, a lot of that has parallels in the civil rights revolution that had happened in the 50s and the 60s. And suddenly there was an open space for this new idea that the people, the caste, so to speak, who had been held down for a very long time, including the linguistics rights that you, you mentioned, according to some people, would now have more of a say and that there would be a head start given. And many generations have gone by since then. And our question now is, what is affirmative action for? And I hope that that's something that people are keeping in mind in Nepal, because the last thing I want to say to somebody of the Dalit caste at this point is, and this is the sort of thing Tom Sowell was comfortable saying to everybody way, way back. He and I are different in this way. I wouldn't say to this person, you should be prepared after about 20 years to fend for yourself in this country because affirmative action, if it's permanent, ends up creating more problems than it solves. Nevertheless, it is what I'm thinking. And I wonder if they're thinking about that kind of thing because, and this is my last point, Many people would tell you, when I was at Berkeley where these things were being debated very hotly in the late 90s, many people would lean in my office doorway and tell me that affirmative action should end when society, you know, is when, when a school's student body looks like society, or general variations on the idea that affirmative action ends when there's no racism. And I, I disagree with that. I'm not sure there can ever be no racism. And it's really that you're using something as one of many solutions. But you can't keep it going forever because after a while the dominant groups start to feel like it's unfair and they're not exactly wrong. And you get strange members of the subdominant group, such as myself, who start to complain that one would like <laughs> a members of having gotten what they've gotten without the help after a while. So I just wonder what kind of debate they're having in Nepal in terms of the passage of time as opposed to what's going on right now. Uh, well, there's no... Um cognizance of the of uh, the need to time limit I didn't hear any talk of that sort um, I, I actually myself took a somewhat different stance than the one that you've just outlined uh, in the debate uh, and I uh, you and I touched on this a bit the last time we talked about this which was rather than time limit you know it ends in 2020 or 2025 or whatever um, I would prefer indefinite with an emphasis on the exceptional character of what we do. That is, we've departed from business as usual because of historical exigency. We're engaging in race conscious um, policy intervention, which is the departure from, um, from what we would ordinarily want to do. And the historical exigency is that we're dealing with the aftermath of a long period of racially based uh, so subordination of an important element of the population. So mm -hmm. that's the problem that we're trying to deal with. And affirmative action as a tool is definitely a departure from uh, the ideal um, ways of our interacting with each other in the polity. So we are engaged in an exceptional activity here. We're aware of that, and hence we will tolerate it only to some degree. But we don't have to say in advance uh, what it is. But if you want something measurable, you're saying, you know, when we have parity or whatever, then well, I of course agree with you. We're never going, you know, never going to live in a world in which there is no echo or remnant uh, surviving uh, aspect uh, of our history of uh, you know racial unfairness. It, it's asking too much uh, to do that. Um, but I guess the other thing I would uh, would ask here is, um, yeah, I think you really put the question uh, well. What is affirmative action for? So what are we trying to accomplish? And I think when we ask and answer that question, we'll have a better idea of how long we want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, let, so let me be concrete. Suppose I'm talking about a police force and you want it to be diverse and you give an exam to people before you hire them and the blacks do poor on the exam, except that the city is 37% black, there's been a history of riots, blacks are two-thirds of the people who are arrested for drug trafficking in the city, and there's all this kind of stuff. And you really want to have a racially integrated police force. You don't want to have a white, uh, ethnic, uh, dominated police force that are living in uh, middle class, lower middle class suburbs outside the city, mm -hmm. coming in and lording it over with the occasional use of deadly force and, and the need uh, to deal with the occasional outburst of civic unrest, mm -hmm. uh, a uh, largely black and Latino, lower class, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you don't want that. Mm -hmm. 
So that might be forever. Hmm. That could go on for a very long time. I don't know why that ends in 2025. Well, I, I, uh, I'm trying to manage a city. I need an ethnically diverse police force. The blacks don't do as well on the exam. It'd be better if they did better on the exam, but I mean, that could go on for a very long time. And I would contrast that with some other examples that we could give, but I'll let you talk because I've been doing I would say that um, that's a very good example because I would say that there's one where chemotherapy is the analogy. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to have this mostly white police force and they are inevitably making life difficult for having negative interactions with a predominantly black inner city population. No, that's not the way it should be for any number of reasons. But you can only have this, this pass given on the test for so long because this is what happens. And I know that you're touching also on some cases that have turned up in New Haven and New York and other places yeah. where there have been complaints that black applicants don't pass these tests as much. There is something not discussed in those cases, and it's alarming that it isn't discussed, but it's understandable because it's an example of what happens when affirmative action becomes cultural rather than a direct political tool, which is that you never hear from these black applicants who have suffered that they could study harder. And so you, you hear about whites who come from disadvantaged circumstances who've really pushed and done three times as much as anybody else to make sure they pass that test. But with the black ones, the idea is they don't pass it at rates as high as everybody else, and therefore there is discrimination called a disparate impact, and we need to change the requirements rather than, and I swear this is what would have been done 100 years ago or even 60 years ago, rather than saying we need to get it among ourselves to learn how to pass this test. Maybe our life skills or maybe our backgrounds haven't equipped us for this as well as other people, but certainly we can do it, which they can, and there's evidence. And so we'll do that instead. It doesn't come up, and I think that it's because there there's a sense that to be black or Latino is to be inherently exempt from those things, and it's not fair to subject people to those things, which is an idea that settles in after you've had a policy like this that goes for generations. Quick example, Berkeley. I've been gone from Berkeley now for 10 years, actually, this July. But, of course, I keep up with what's going on there. And one thing that happened after the old-style racial quotas were banned was that people started trying to favor black people and Latino people through the back door. Now, a little of that probably makes some sense, but what it meant was that, for example, a Korean immigrant child who had grown up with very little money and lived in off neighborhoods and one of whose parents had been very sick would be turned down whereas a Mexican or a black person with the exact same life circumstances and qualifications on paper that actually weren't as good and also a parent maybe who had been sick would get in out of a sense that somehow if you're Korean you're expected to do your best despite whatever happens to you but if you're black or Latino then there's some other issue involved. And I think most of us can see the problem with that when you think of the individual black or Latino person. And that's what worries me a lot, and that would even count with the police forces. You don't want to create a culture where it's not expected that anybody with brown skin can pass tests, because you know where that goes. Well, I guess I don't buy the way you're framing it. I'm, I, you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about Irish working class ethnics and the civil service in Boston. Mm -hmm working for the probation department or working for the Department of Motor Vehicles mm -hmm. or working in the city uh, offices of one kind or another or working in these various politically uh, influenced uh, sinecures mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, ethnic machines uh, created. Mm -hmm. And what I'm thinking is that I don't know that there's any taint on Irish Americanness mm -hmm. surviving into the year 2012. Mm -hmm from the fact that uh, their uncles, grandfathers, aunties, uh, cousins, mm -hmm. and whatever, scratched each other's backs and, um, you know, uh, did what was necessary in order to uh, practice a kind of nepotistic, sort of politically mediated, um, crony-like um, patronage mm -hmm. uh, uh, through the public sector uh, on behalf of, of their, uh, them and their folk. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can think about that, but we will. We may think it was, you know, um, contrary to good civic uh, conduct, that it was uh, uh, in inefficient, corrupt, uh, uh, whatever. But the idea that it was soul-killing, mm -hmm. which is, to me, what you just got through saying, 
if blacks keep getting exempted from having to get a 92 on the test and be able to get the job with an 87 instead, the end result will be that they're, they'll somehow be impaired, destroyed, diminished, stigmatized. Uh, Only in the last word you said, stigmatized. I don't think that the black people in question have any problem with it at all. It's what. Yeah, is oh, what, okay, but so here's the problem. See, the problem is the fact. So, what I meant with the Irish example was mm -hmm. to say um, uh, that there's nothing new in this. Mm -hmm. th th there's nothing new in an exception to meritocracy on behalf of. Uh, you know, elements of the population that uh, feel themselves in one way or another not adequately taken care of and a kind of accommodation of that. There's nothing new in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that it would be stigmatizing in a way that would diminish the, the sort of uh, status or ability to, to garner honor and respect from others is itself a reflection of the subordinate status and mm -hmm. um, the sort of discriminatory cast of the society vis-a-vis -vis this group mm -hmm. and, and shouldn't be used as a basis for uh, denying uh, or delegitimating uh, efforts to, to include them uh, that uh, are not all that dissimilar to Glenn, efforts that have been practiced on behalf of others in the past. Glenn, don't you see a difference between the old style system where the Irish had muscled their way into these city machines and they basically pick one another to serve. So obviously they're not you know, passing tests, there are all sorts of you know, doors being opened in the back. But they are the ones who run the show and they bring in one another. As a person, Irish, Italians, Jews, yeah, they all Slavs, I just want to make clear, mm -hmm. I'm not just talking about the Irish. And there were small black machines like that here and there. Sure, and there right. A couple. Let's, so that's one thing. Then there's another thing where we've gotten past that particular situation in most cities. And instead we have these tests and everybody is required to perform to a certain way on those tests except for people with brown skin and the idea is that we're going to lower the score for them. Don't you see that there is more of a question of stigmatization there than there is in the previous one because the Irish had muscled their way into that situation. You could say they got in there and now they're just basically taking care of their own as opposed to there being this one cast of people and it becomes a cast where, well, you guys don't have to do as well on the test, with there being also in the air this strong stigma, of course created by others, but it's there, that black people can't quite cut the mustard mentally. It seems that the conditions are somewhat different, wouldn't you think? No, the, the examples are just meant to be, you know, they're not perfectly uh, matched, and I agree that the situations are a bit different, but I, I, what I'm disagreeing with is um, that the underperformance of the blacks on the test, which necessitates some kind of affirmative action like intervention in order to secure their um, adequate representation, mm -hmm. is some kind of, um, you know, uh, signal of their inadequacy that needs to be faced up to and overcome rather than papered over and mollified. Again, I'm paraphrasing with that sentence what I understand the essence of your argument to be. Why don't they man up? Mm -hmm. Why don't they just face up to the fact that they need to do better on the test? Because they so, yeah. can. Right. Well, <laughs> um, I don't understand fully why there is such a significant, persistent, and you, you, everywhere you look you find it, racial disparity in this kind of paper and pencil test taking uh, skill. It's a tough one, yeah. Uh, it's out there. Now, you know, are blacks genetically inferior and they're just not as intelligent or whatever? Of course, no. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. that, and I don't believe that the social scientific evidence says that either. No. On the other hand, it's a stubborn reality of contemporary American life that that's the case. Everywhere you look, that's the case. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got people, good people. Um, my former student and friend, Roland Fryer, the economist at Harvard, is one of them with all the work that he's doing on education in New York City and in Houston and so on, um, you know, who are devoting their lives to trying to close the uh, achievement gap, they call it, mm -hmm. uh, the racial achievement gap. doesn't need to be that the inner city kids test so low and so forth, and I'm sure that their education can be improved, and perhaps that gap can somehow be closed by policy, but it is a heck of a task. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would be a monumental achievement were that to be the case. I don't think anybody should expect to see it in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. there we are. Why? There we are. 
Well, you, so you're just asking me the same question I said I didn't know the answer to, yeah. <laughs> which was I'm not sure why. Just to, I mean, why would I expect the gap to close only slowly? Yeah. Based on just based on historical experience, that it doesn't move that fast. Well, I have to vent, I have to answer here because that's 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 a very key point. Okay. It changes significantly when the cultural conditions are such that it has to. And what I mean by that is. These test discrepancies can be really odd. I remember, I think enough time has gone by that I'll say, I used to know some people at Berkeley who would have aspirations to be grad students in Berkeley departments. And I would get to know them, and all sorts of signs were good. And I can think of three instances, exactly three, not more, but three, where this person, a bright black American, always black American, not Caribbean or African heritage, black American person, would give every sign of being on their way to this, and then it would turn out that their performance on the GRE was nothing like what you would expect, and that that had also been true with the SATs. And what I saw there, it clearly wasn't any problem with mental aptitude. It was something about this kind of test, that oblique way of going at knowledge, that way of asking questions, and something, and I don't claim to know what the answer is, some people have tried, something about, I hate to say it, but black culture, somehow, something about it that doesn't make taking those sorts of tests as natural as it is for some white kid who grows up in Scarsdale. And it seems that Asian immigrant kids, they learn how to handle these weird tests and, and the questions because they had to. And at Berkeley, when affirmative action was outlawed, although, yes, at first, over half of the colored student body went down, it quickly started going up, and it's gone down by small blips every now and then since. But it was because word got out that people needed to learn how to be better on these tests, and a great many black and Latino kids were able. They didn't have to before. Who would want to learn how to do that anyway if you don't have to? But once you have to, it's something that people can show themselves to be capable of doing. I was heartened by that. So I don't think it would take 100 years. Okay, John. I mean, I almost want to say whatever, but that would, that, that would be rude. I mean, in the, in the sense that, first of all... You're going for something larger. No, no, I don't think we know. I, I mean, people have been studying this for forever, okay, psychometricians and neuropsychological whatever and all this. People have been studying this for a long time, and, and I just have the sense that there's something of a mystery here. I mean, what we know, we know around the edges. And you just made an assertion of faith. You know, you said that if you force people to have to do something, they'll learn how to oh, do no, it. Oh, no, I, I mean, saw it happen. Uh, okay, but that's an anecdote, John. An anecdote in terms of the quality. I mean, so of maybe it would be true California. about a certain kind of upper middle class black kid who's underperforming at a place like Berkeley or Harvard. They turn out to be one tenth of one percent of the African American population. Mm -hmm. The achievement gap is driven at the median by the performance of an eleventh grade kid at the Washington D.C. inner city high school. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and I and I just don't know if your anecdote about what happened at Berkeley when they did something about affirmative action applies to that. What case. happened in the whole state of California to the population applying to those schools, not just at Berkeley University? But I take your point that we don't know as much about it with less privileged kids. Oh, these are middle class kids. They weren't. The but so and so, I was making a different kind of argument, which was first of all, I don't know why so much weight has to be placed on a test for every activity, like hiring a firefighter. Mm -hmm. You might be able to argue that if I'm trying to enroll people in a linguistics PhD program at Berkeley, I want to look at the GRE and at the GRE analytic and quantitative scores, if that's relevant, hmm. uh, to see whether or not they're going to be able to pass the hard courses that you need to do in order to become uh, a PhD in linguistics. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, you know, I've been a college teacher for nearly 40 years, man, and I can tell you that it, there's no one-to-one -one connection. I mean, when I look at graduate students who are creative, who have the ability to ask an interesting question, who are resourceful, who write well, who are prepared to read something about history and sociology and politics as well as about economics in order to cast their problem uh, to develop their hypotheses, uh, who are uh, industrious and entrepreneurial and um, uh, are willing to take risk. I mean, that these, are, these are qualities that are all related to whether or not over the arc of a 35 or 40 year career somebody is going to be able to make an impact. If we're going to ration access to the profession, based upon their ability to perform on a test that when we get uh, applicants from China, they're all at the 99th percentile. Mm -hmm. 
We, we have to basically flip a, throw a dart at a dartboard and flip a coin to decide which one of these 99 percentile Chinese applicants from Beijing University um, or Korean applicants from Yangtze University in Seoul or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to admit because we could otherwise fill our whole program with them. Mm -hmm. And do you know what? It would be with respect to my Chinese and Korean students and friends, not as interesting, no. not as rich, not as creative, not as scientifically potent and productive a department if we were to do so. Mm -hmm. So so what I'm pushing back against here is, first of all, the claim that, well, blacks will do fine on the test if they just put their noses to the grindstone. I don't know that you know that, and I'm not sure it's true. Mm -hmm. But secondly, that if I give a test and the blacks don't pass at the same rate, the only thing we can do is ask the blacks to up their test-taking skills, because after all, the test is a test is something that is uh, somehow enshrined as uh, the ideal way of rationing access to these things. Mm -hmm. and it's not. It's a conventional way of rationing. It's a way that we've come to rely on to ration. It has certain informational value, but it is not a Rosetta Stone. It's not a... It's not the uh, template of the, to me that we oh, should be using not. to frame everything we do. These tests are very imperfect, and oh, yeah. you know, et cetera. So. The, test, the test can't be everything. And a little thing with language you did, I just want to make sure, not put your nose to the grindstone, because that implies that what I'm saying is that black people have been being lazy. Trying. And I don't mean that remotely at all. I mean it's been a situation where an individual actor had been able to get into Berkeley without doing a certain something. And it's not that they knew that they weren't doing it. It's that there was no reason to do it. Whereas I think... Oh, I see, because it was already taken care yeah. of by the affirmative action thing. Yeah, how, how would you know? It took away, the, well, when it took I away have, their incentives. Yeah, and I think that that old argument, which I think has value, and there are some people who have even tried to to numericize it with economic papers. I could refer to some. I don't know how authoritative they're considered. Yes, we have. But I may have even written some books. Yeah, I think that the incentive does matter. And I think that it's not a matter of somebody not having put their nose to the grindstone. I really mean I have faith. I really, for various reasons that are anecdotal, yeah. although I don't think the state of California is an anecdote, I think that they could do it if okay. they had to. But the other point is that here's where we're never going to agree, and I can't claim that I have any authority on this, this really comes okay. to a matter of taste. If the situation has been for X years that there are these tests, and we both know the tests aren't perfect, and I don't think that the tests should be used in some yeah. you know, ridiculous way, if the tests have been in place, I cannot countenance the idea that people, no matter how smart, say, if black people don't do as well on the tests, let's question the value of the tests and take them away. I consider it, and I don't know what political or class this puts me in, I consider it imperative that despite the imperfections of the test, that black people show that they can do as well on them as everybody else, just to have a whole lot of things taken care of, including the idea that nobody thinks that black people are dumber, because that's a real tough one. And so well, that, you're, you're right, we don't agree about this, uh, because to me, if blacks didn't do as well on the test, uh, and it was important that I have black representation in the position, that's, to me, a reason to ask, is the test absolutely necessary for the position? I'm not saying this is a legal matter. I'm saying this is a pragmatic right. matter. Right. Because, as I say, the test is a very crude uh, instrument. So, so if I thought that diversity of uh, participation in whatever program or activity I'm selecting for was a value in and of itself, and if the test had this disparate... Uh, impact on blacks. I'd at least raise the question. Now, the answer may be yes, the test is testing, you know, how good they can solve the problem, mm -hmm. uh, how effectively they're going to be able to do it. And it correlates 0.7 with the outcome that we're interested in, and these are, uh, and, and then I would have to say, well, yeah, uh, and we certainly don't want to make a mistake by picking people who are not going to be qualified, and that would be costly and costly to those people and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And then I trade off my interest in the racial representation uh, against my need to. Uh, rationally um, uh, limit uh, who participates in the program, mm -hmm. and I rely on the test. On the other hand, if I found that the test was only loosely correlated with what I was interested in, mm -hmm. uh, that it measured a narrow range of the broad skills that were going to be required for su success in the position, uh, that it was a historical inheritance that we've been using for 20 years because we've been using it for 20 years and perhaps not for any other reason, uh, that it created a, 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 a kind of bias, and I use the word advisedly, in the uh, kinds of people that I ended up with uh, participating in the program. Because like I say, if we rationed access to an economics PhD program based only on GRE scores, uh, there would all be uh, uh, no, uh, people from Northeast Asia would be the uh, vast majority in South Asia, the vast majority of our students. Yeah. 
Uh, so, so then I might say, well, you know, okay, I got the test. It's one tool in the toolkit, but I got other ways of making judgments too, and, and I'm not going to let that test keep me from meeting my representation goal. Go so that's, you know, we would have different, we just have different. But before we close on yeah. this, let me just ask you a question, because some of these yes, things start with anecdote. And pardon me if I'm stepping on toes, but I just want to see, based on that perspective you have. I'm I, fighting, Jack. I personally, for some reason, I think part of it is because I went to private schools where we were given those, I think starting about third grade, we started getting these sort of multiple choice bubble tests asking those weirdly specific questions. Yeah. And maybe because I was a readaholic, although I don't think that's all of it, because a lot of these black students I've talked about who had the low GREs were also big readers. But yeah. those tests, that SAT-ish format, and this is not bragging for anybody who might misinterpret it this way, it's that I'm really trying to get at something. Those tests have never thrown me. You know, I'm not, I don't, for reasons that we won't get into, I never took the SAT precisely. I took the PSAT. I don't remember what I got. It was not perfect. But I've always scored highly on those. They were not hard. GRE was the same thing. Right. I presume that you're the same way, right? Oh, yeah, you know, I was off the charts, John. Okay. <laughs> Again, not bragging, but right. yeah, now, I was what off you, the charts. What, what do you think is the difference <laughs> between you and you grew up in less, you know, what you might call leave it to beaver circumstances than I did. What is it that you have that, say, one of these aspiring graduate students I'm talking about from 20 years ago did not have? Or do you just have no idea? I'm not sure I know what it is. Well, I, I can, you know, less than leave it to beaver circumstances. It was inner city Chicago, you know, not the roughest neighborhood, but it was Chicago public schools and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just, <laughs> it's hard to talk about this. I mean, I've always been a quick study. I've always had a gift. I, I was, you know, blessed, I mm -hmm. think, with, I mean, John, I, I mean, I'll tell you, this gets into my autobiography perhaps more than you want to know, but, it, you know, not only did I do well on the test, when I, when I finally got serious about college, I went to college and then I dropped out, got married, started a family, and then I went back to college. Mm -hmm. And I was serious the second time I was, when I finally got serious. I was amazed at, at uh, how um, uh, effortlessly I was able to master vast areas of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I learned mathematics, I learned economics, I studied politics and political theory and philosophy, I studied the German language, I studied literature. I got an incredible education at Northwestern the two years and one summer that I was there. And then I went to MIT, which was the best economics department in the world as a PhD student, but, you know, I mean, there were 25 people in the class, and they had all been at the top of their classes at people like, places like Yale and Princeton and Stanford and, you know, in France and England and Italy and Japan and whatnot. Um, and I was at the top of my class, and I mean, it was like, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that I was doing as well as, that I, as I was doing. It was, uh, it was just a wonderfully empowering thing. So, you know, this is a very sort of unique story. And when they put, you know, they put a uh, set of these multiple choice questions in front of me and a set of these kind of logic puzzles and whatnot, and I just ripped through them, you know. Well, I mean, I hope to God that what we're, <laughs> we're zeroing in on now, because what you're saying, and I understand that, that's a great story. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to, no one's going to like this, but I'm gonna have to be truthful. I amaze myself with, what a good autodidact I've always been as well. And I hope that this doesn't mean, because you know what this sounds like, it's that doing well on these tests has something to do with that elusive thing called intelligence. Um, maybe this isn't helping, because I'm trying to think of it as this very peculiar, specific skill, like being good at playing the oboe or something, and that we want to somehow nurture it. But you're making it sound like it's just, if you're really bright, you're good at these tests and they do measure intelligence, in which case I'm really uncomfortable with the whole idea of saying, well, if black people don't do well on them, then let's just take away the tests, because it looks like they well, do measure something. We need to be careful. We really need to be careful here, John, and I, I, I share your uh, sense of foreboding about the conversation that we're having right now, because we don't want to give the public impression no. of being assholes, you know, we're just so stuck on ourselves and think we're so brilliant, how come other black people aren't as smart as we are? And no. Something? So we don't want to give that impression and we don't think that. Right. Okay, I know you agree with that. Right. Uh, I want to, having said that, say this. There is such a thing as intelligence. Okay? I mean, I now speak both as the Merton Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences at Brown University who spent four decades 
in the quantitative social sciences and who I feel I have some sense of mastery and knowledge of the literatures in uh, psychology and in the, uh, the social uh, uh, economic uh, you know, uh, area and whatnot. I've read a lot of those books and a lot of those papers. Uh, I think it's very hard to deny that there is human variability in mental, in, in mental ability. There's differences across individuals within populations and the capacity to use their minds to solve certain kinds of problems. Um, there are racial differences in the distribution of this ability as it has come to be acquired by people when they are measured and tested in their uh, uh, adolescence and in their adulthood. Um, my firm belief as a social scientist it is not a political opinion, this is not a racial opinion, this is my belief as a social scientist, is that such differences as do exist by race in these acquired capacities to use our minds are largely the result, primarily the result, of the developmental processes that people are embedded in and the cultural and psychological influences over the, on them over the course of their, uh, of their early life into their uh, young adulthood. Uh, I don't think that they reflect uh, deep uh, genetic uh, sort of inborn uh, uh, traits that are passed on uh, across generations and that are characteristic of African descended versus European descended populations and about which nothing can be done in terms of social policy. I don't believe that at all. Uh, but there are these differences in intelligence and I, uh, acquired capacities of mental performance in one way or another and I do think that some tests can measure those uh, differences uh, uh, pretty well. Now, you know, the argument I was making earlier was that even so, I might not want to rest on those tests as a way of rationing access to a program of study because that's not the only thing that's important uh, for selecting people for a program of study. But I do think that those differences are there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, at the personal level, I think, uh, you know, I was blessed uh, with certain abilities and those are not you know, everybody doesn't have them, and that's just a story about me. It's not a story about, quote, my race, close quote. It's a story about me. Yeah. You know, Glenn, we have to stop here. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, yeah, we do, John, but there's more to talk about. We'll talk again. We should, and, and we should probably pick back up on this topic, because it really, it's, the, it's a silent killer. It's really lying just underneath the whole debate. Okay, so let's come back to this topic about racial differences in performance on tests and what we think about that. And maybe we could give it the title, If You Guys Are So Smart, Why Are You On Blogging Heads? Why Aren't You Rich? <laughs> <laughs> if You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Rich? That'll okay. be in the comment section anyway. <laughs> so Glenn, good to talk I tried to preempt that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, very good to talk to you. Talk to you very soon.